Ok, bon retour. Uh, bienvenue à nouveau. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Uh, we will uh, move on with the uh, third session. My name is Nicolas Chaumont from University of Montreal. My name is Kumita Devadas from University of Science Malaysia. And so this uh, fourth, third, sorry, session is uh, Cure Advances Globally, and we'll have uh, several talks. So we, we will take questions at the end of the first three talks, and then we will have group questions for the last three talks. And it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Sabrina Brumer is a professor in the Faculty of Health Science at Simon Fraser University and the laboratory director at the British Columbia Center for Excellence HIV AIDS in Vancouver in Canada. Her research program integrates molecular biology, epidemiology, and computational approaches to study HIV genetic diversity and evolution with the goal of informing HIV vaccine and eradication strategies. And so we asked Sabrina to give an overview on the virology of the reservoir, which is not an easy task. So thank you very much, Sabrina, for accepting to do this. Thank you very much, Nicola, and to the organizers for giving this opportunity. And as Nicola mentioned, um, I was asked to give a, a summary, an accessible summary of reservoir virology in 15 minutes. So I'm going to attempt to do that um, starting from the very beginning. Um, as many of us will know, HIV is a retrovirus. And what that means is that its genome is made up of RNA. And during the course of the life cycle, the RNA is retrotranscribed into double-stranded DNA. And that double-stranded DNA copy of the viral genome is physically inserted into the genome of the host cell. And that process is irreversible. Uh, usually after this, the cell turns you know, into a virus factory. Um, and after that, the infected cell usually dies, excuse me, um, or is eliminated by the immune system. But what happens in a small number of uh, cases when a, a virus infected, uh, infects a cell inside the body, the first half of the life cycle all the way to integration proceeds. And then after that, the process stalls. These cells that harbor a copy of HIV within them um, are called viral reservoirs, and they're the main barrier to HIV remission um, and cure. Antiretroviral therapies um, don't eliminate these cells. These cells are largely invisible to the immune system, and they can persist for years. The other problem is that they can clonally expand, and when they do that, they produce daughter cells that also contain integrated HIV within them. And as we've, uh, as we're, many of us are aware, viral reservoirs can reactivate at any time to produce infectious HIV. And this is why combination antiretroviral therapy needs to be maintained for life. For the next two minutes, I'm gonna to attempt to summarize reservoir dynamics. So what this is showing here is that uh, um, most uh, HIV infections are caused by a single transmitted founder virus that replicates um, over time in the body in the absence of antiretroviral treatment. And this yields um, descendants of this founder virus that differ genetically. They get uh, more uh, divergent and uh, genetically diverse from the founder virus. Um, and when ART is initiated, the viral load uh, is undetectable in blood. But underneath this process, members of this replicating virus population will integrate into host cells and persist for you know some amount of time. What I want to illustrate with this slide is uh, two concepts that we've um, uh, come to appreciate recently. First is that clonal expansion of these cells is a major way in which the reservoir sustains itself. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize is that these reservoir cells persist for quite a long time, but not forever. Over time, some of them are eliminated. Um, and what we have appreciated in the last couple of years is that by the time that ART is initiated, many of the earliest lineages that were laid down at the beginning um, of reservoir seeding have already been eliminated from the body. And what this means is that at the time of ART-mediated suppression, a majority of the integrated viruses are going to date to the year or two immediately prior to initiation of therapy. We also know that as soon as you initiate antiretroviral therapy, after that, the rate of reservoir decay is very slow um, with a half-life of about uh, four years. Uh, nevertheless, when ART is stopped, HIV will nevertheless re-emerge, usually in a matter of weeks. The other thing that we've learned in the past five to 10 years is that only a very small proportion of proviruses that persist during long-term ART are genetically intact. Nine 95 to 98% of these viruses are genetically defective, usually because of the presence of very, very large deletions, um, but there's also hypermutations and other, uh, other defects. One important um, 
thing related to nomenclature. When we're talking about the word reservoir, we're talking about a cell that harbors intact replication competent HIV that's capable of reactivating to produce viruses that can infect other cells. Cells, however, with defective proviruses, um, these are not technically part of the reservoir, although they might produce HIV transcripts um, uh, and proteins, and they might contribute to immune activation. Okay, for the next four minutes or so, I want to talk about key methods for studying the reservoir, starting with methods for reservoir quantification, and after that, methods for characterizing uh, reservoir cells. Um, so the first and historic assay for quantifying the reservoir is called the Quantitative Viral Outgrowth Assay, or the QBOA. Here we start with resting, uh, purified resting CD4 positive T cells. We plate them out in culture at limiting dilution. We stimulate them in vitro to reactivate HIV uh, in the wells that contain uh, um, uh, cells harboring HIV genome. We have to add more cells so that the viruses have somewhere to go to propagate the virus and culture. And at the end, we use a P24 ELISA assay uh, to determine the infectious copies of HIV per million CD4 positive T cells. Uh, this assay is the gold standard, but is laborious. It takes quite a bit of biological material. And as we heard this morning, underestimates reservoir size because not all of the cells will reactivate in vitro. Uh, um, three, oh, excuse me, I keep, I have both slides here. <laughs> it's a bit confusing. Um, the second assay that I wanted to talk about is the intact proviral DNA assay. Um, this is a higher throughput assay, uh, and it actually starts with DNA extracted from the CD4 positive T cells. It is a PCR-based assay that has two targets uh, in the HIV genome, one at the beginning and one near the end, and joint detection of both targets discriminates more than 90% of defective proviruses. So if you have both targets, chances are that's an intact uh, that's an intact provirus. It uses droplet digital PCR, which is similar to regular PCR, except for instead of doing one giant reaction, that reaction is fractionated into 20,000 nanoliter sized reactions, each of which proceeds in parallel. And detection of these targets takes place in every individual well. And after that, this is what the raw data looks like. We have uh, droplets that are double negative, meaning no targets detected, uh, uh, droplets that are single positive, meaning one target detected, that's a defective genome. And the the ones that have double detection um, are the intact uh, proviruses. So results in this case are expressed as intact proviral genomes per million CD4 positive T cells. Uh, one thing we heard about in the in the morning, though, one limitation is currently the primers and probes used in this assay don't capture all HIV variants, uh, but work is being done on that. Um, next, I want to talk about reservoir genetic characterization. We've already seen some data uh, with respect to this. I want to start by talking about full-length individual proviral sequencing. So how do we determine uh, the sequence of individual individual proviruses. Again, we start from the DNA extracted from CD4 positive T cells. We plate that at limiting dilution such that most wells don't contain any HIV DNA at all, only some of them do. We then use PCR using primers that uh, bind at the edges, the ends of the HIV genome to amplify everything in between. And we can use a, a, gel, a gel electrophoresis to figure out which wells had HIV. We get bands of different sizes because most of these genomes are deleted. And then we can sequence these individual amplicons. And then from that, we get the sequence as well as we can infer the uh, level of intactness of each individual uh, viral gene. Genome. One limitation of this approach, though, is that it doesn't allow us to simultaneously figure out anything else about the genome, for example, its integration site. The reason for that is when you dilute your DNA in this way, you have basically one shot to do one thing and you can't do anything else. Um, the only way that we could do something else is if somehow we could amplify the amount of DNA that we started with. Um, and recently, um, that has been able to be done with a technique called multiple displacement amplification. Before moving on um, with the rest of the assays, we take the limiting dilution DNA, we amplify all of the entire contents of the DNA well by MDA, and after that, we can aliquot that out, and we can do multiple things with each well, so um, integration site plus uh, the full genome. And finally, I wanted to end with a little bit of summary of um, things that we've learned about the reservoir in the last few years, and I'll, the overarching question is, sounds like a simple one, but where? You know, where is the reservoir? Um, and the answer to that is somewhat multidimensional. When we talk about where, we can talk about, well, where in the genome did the provirus integrate? Or at the second level, what cell types harbor HIV reservoirs? Or at the third level, what tissues in the body harbor HIV reservoirs? And this is important because the location 
This location information influences reservoir longevity, reactivation, and genetic composition. I just wanted to show a little bit of data from a couple of recent studies. Uh, first, showing that integration site in the human genome may influence the likelihood of persistence. And this is some data uh, from a paper by Lily Cohen Group published last year. Um, they looked at uh, expanded CD4 positive T cell clones uh, and people that had these expanded T cell clones. And they looked at the integration site and they found that these proviruses were not randomly integrated everywhere into the genome, but rather were integrated into specific places, um, specifically within crab domain containing zinc finger genes. And here is uh, one phylogeny from one individual. The expanded clones are the big ones in different colors, and the green boxes show the ones that are integrated in these genes. Um, here are the rest of the individuals from the study. You can see lots of um, integrations into these specific gene sites. So the conclusion was that integration into certain genomic sites might help um, reservoir cells persist following clonal expansion. Here are some more data from elite controllers. Um, here, uh, Shu Yu's group uh, looked at <clears throat> clonally expanded proviruses in elite controllers, and again, found that they weren't integrated everywhere randomly, but they tended to be integrated into transcriptionally inactive regions in the human genome, like centromeric satellite DNA. And in, in, you can see those examples boxed in green again. Now, this is not because HIV in elite controllers behaves a different way and preferentially integrates into these genes. It integrates everywhere. However, the immune systems in these individuals are so great at uh, controlling HIV that they're, they eliminate the cells with proviruses integrated into more active regions, leaving only these ones behind. Moving on to cell type. Well, cell type matters as well. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, CD4 T cell subsets, um, they differ in the degree of clonal expansion. So here I'm showing that CD4 positive T cells, which are the major HIV reservoir, they develop along a continuum um, such that if a naive cell, for example, harbors an integrated provirus, so will its descendants as it differentiates along the pathway. But one uh, important observation is that these clonally expanded proviruses they tend to be enriched in effector memory cells. Um, I also wanted to touch upon another cell type that's important, macrophages. These might be distinctive reservoirs of HIV. These cells are found in all tissues. They are long-lived. They're relatively resistant to killing by both HIV and the immune system. And they happen to reside in sites with reduced ART penetration, like the brain. These properties could yield genetically distinctive proviral populations in certain tissues. So moving on to tissues, where in HIV, uh, where in the body does HIV reside? Well, as you heard from this morning, uh, HIV, it can be found in many, many, many tissues in the body, uh, not necessarily in all cases because HIV can physically infect the cells of that tissue. Sometimes it's because specialized immune cells traffic to those tissues. Um, but one relevant question that we have is that, well, if HIV resides in all these places, how representative is the genetic diversity of HIV in the blood representative of the diversity elsewhere? Um, the broad answer to that is that proviral diversity in blood generally in most cases represents that of tissues and the level of genetic compartmentalization in tissues is generally limited, as is shown here by uh, one uh, slide. This is a phylogeny from one individual and you can see that the sequences sampled from many parts of the body generally intermix in the phylogeny, but there are some exceptions. Some tissues can harbor proviral populations with distinctive genetic features, and one such place could be the central nervous system in the brain, um, as you see here from this uh, clade of sequences uniquely found in the CNS in this study. And finally, I only have 15 minutes, um, <laughs> but I wanted to end on uh, what I think is a really exciting methods uh, innovation, and this is single cell uh, reservoir profiling. And these are techniques that fish out individual cells harboring HIV after their uh, activation in vivo, and after they have been fished out in this way, uh, they can be individually characterized in multi-parametric ways. Um, this is one of the most exciting innovations, in my opinion, and we'll uh, certainly be hearing about lots of uh, innovations in this area in the upcoming uh, main meeting as well. So. In summary, uh, intact replication competent HIV persists throughout the body during ART, represents the main barrier to cure. Clonal expansion is a major mechanism that sustains the viral reservoir. A provirus's location, thinking in this multidimensional space, 
can influence its ability to persist, and we continue to innovate methods for reservoir characterization. A uh, big thank you to the institutions and the funders, but most of all, a big thank you for to people who participate in HIV research. Uh, without you, uh, scientific advances would not be possible. Thank you. Uh, so, so we'll take questions right now. I'd like to remind people online that they can ask questions through, through the Q&A uh, box, I guess. And while people will come to the microphone, and I'm sure they will, I will ask you the first question. So in this uh, compartmentalization study with different tissues, uh, you noticed that the brain sequences were quite distinct from the other organs. I was wondering whether you had a chance to check whether or not these viruses were genetically intact or whether they had growth defect or do you think they could grow? And if yes, do you, do you think they have specifics different than the ones you would find in other organs? I think that's a major, so the study that I showed was from the, uh, there was uh, the um, uh, study from the, the last gift team with Antoine Chayon, it wasn't uh, my own work, but your question is one of the most important ones um, to be able to answer. Um, I think that's, Moving forward, we need to make sure as much as possible to be able to amplify the entire viral genome so that we can infer whether what we're looking at is intact or defective, and that will help us understand the composition and the, uh, the distribution of the reservoir across the body um, a lot better. Okay, and can I ask you another horrible question, but you do not have to answer necessarily. So do you think we have discovered what would be the perfect asset to measure the reservoir in every single context? And I'm sure you will say no. So the second part of the question is, what do we miss? What would be the perfect asset to measure the reservoir? I don't think there, I, really, do you think there's going to be a perfect assay to measure the HIV reservoir? <laughs> I don't think there is going to be a perfect assay. Um, I think I think in some ways it's actually at the present time with our understanding a strength that there are lots of different approaches and that people are looking at these approaches in different ways. Right now, um, and we've heard this before this morning as well, I think one of the most important things that folks are working on now is to make sure that the assays that we have are broadly applicable to everyone living with HIV. And we've heard this morning, for example, that a lot of the assays have been developed by scientists in, in, in the United States and you know, Europe and elsewhere, but they have been developed largely uh, using participants who have HIV subtype B, especially the molecular assays uh, for example, the IPDA assay that targets um, the actual sequence of HIV. Well, HIV is very genetically diverse, um, and we have to make sure that these assays are capable of detecting the diversity of HIV that exists. So I think that needs to happen in parallel to innovation of new approaches. I don't know, I kind of dodged your question. No, no, no. <laughs> that was very good. Uh, well, we have no questions. But so Please, students, don't be shy. This is a great opportunity for you to show your face and ask nice questions to our speakers. Uh, you can win a free coffee that I will, uh, you will get in, in an hour, but uh, it would be nice to actually have students go to the microphones and like, ask questions. So thank you very much, Sabrina, and we'll move to the next speaker. All right, our next speaker, Dr. Christian Gebler, is an assistant professor of clinical investigation in the Laboratory of Molecular Immunology at the Rockefeller University. Dr. Gebler received his MD and completed his internal medicine and infectious disease training from the Charit Universitas Medicine in Berlin, Germany, before joining Rockefeller University as a clinical scholar in 2018. His current research focuses on anti-HIV-1, broadly neutralizing antibodies and the characterization of the HIV-1 Latent Reservoir. Um, Dr. Kristen will be joining us online and will be speaking on BNAPs on reservoir size. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. I'm in the process of moving and I'm quite literally sitting on boxes and I'm in between countries. So I'm, um, I'm grateful that I can join via Zoom still. Uh, and thanks for the kind introduction. And um, as uh, you mentioned, I'm going to be speaking on broadly neutralizing antibodies, anti HIV reservoir. And just to start off, uh, I do not have any financial relationships to disclose. And um, a summary for our community, um, what are the key questions that have been asked? Um, so we were very interested 
to see if broadly neutralizing antibody therapy can impact the HIV reservoir. Um, the key finding and take home message would be that we observe changes in the size and composition of the intact proviral reservoir after um, therapy with broadly neutralizing antibody antibodies. And this is important for an HIV cure because the overall goal of an HIV cure research is to have an impact on the reservoir to reduce or silence this reservoir. So I'm, I'm really glad that Sabrina um, started the session off with this talk because, um, I mean, in general, I don't have to lose too many words about the reservoir to this audience. Um, but just as we, as we heard, uh, I want to start off with um, this slide because I think it holds a few key messages. Uh, and so as we just heard, um, there are many different ways of measuring the um, HIV reservoir. All are far from perfect, um, but we have the gold standard of our loud growth assay. We have the intact proval DNA assay. We in our lab have um, established a near full-length sequencing approach that we called Q4-PCR. But what I think was um, quite remarkable to see is when um, either of these assays was applied to study the half-life um, of um, the HIV reservoir in people living with HIV who had been on suppressive ART for um, long periods of time, um, in this nice Michael Peluso study, even up to 20 years, um, uh, in the end, all these different assays reached or came to a very similar estimate uh, about the, the duration of the, or the half-life of the HIV reservoir, so somewhere between four to five years. And in the case of Michael Peluso's study, um, there seemed to be even um, a, a two-phase decay with a faster decay within the first seven years after art initiation and then a, a longer half-life up to 19 years um, after that. Um, and so I think what this shows us is that the half-life is um, extremely long and we cannot rely on uh, a natural decay to see a dent or to, to have an impact on the reservoir, but we do need some um, form of intervention to, um, to impact the HIV reservoir in the context of HIV cure research. So um, being um, a part of the Nussenzweig lab, I'm always, uh, of course, promoting antibodies, but I hope with this slide, I can also convince you why we are thinking that broadly neutralizing antibodies um, could have a potential role in um, these types of studies. Um, and what you see here on the very left side is that um, the more direct effects of antibodies, so the more direct viral neutralizing properties, which have shown um, 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 before, so they broadly neutralizing antibodies can prevent transmission of HIV, they can suppress active viral replication, um, even in the absence of ART. But when we look at the middle panel and the right panel, um, what they can also do is with their FC portion of the antibody, they can mediate effector functions. So they can engage other parts of the immune system, um, macrophages and K cells, um, which helps detect and potentially clear some of those HIV infected cells and could potentially reduce the HIV latent reservoir. And more generally, they um, with immune complexes or directly, they can stimulate a um, host antiviral adaptive uh, immune response. So this looks good on the schematic, but what are the actual indicators that um, antibodies can uh, indeed do this? We have, we have several studies showing this in animal models, but um, just as an example, I would like to take this um, trial that we have performed um, previously in our lab and that was published in 2018. Uh, and it was an antibody combination trial um, that used two antibodies. 3BNC117 and 10-1074, 3BNC117, a CD4 binding site antibody, and 10-1074, an antibody that recognizes the V3 loop on the um, HIV envelope protein. And in this um, study, um, uh, roughly 15 participants were enrolled, um, people living with HIV who had been chronically infected, and they received three antibody infusions of the combination of these two antibodies. And then there were um, um, entered a phase of analytical treatment interruption uh, and a baseline sample was taken before the therapy. And um, in case they reached um, um, the week 12 time point, another um, leukapheresis sample would have um, been taken. And so my colleague, Pilar Mendoza, um, back then looked at the HIV reservoir in these um, uh, study participants using a viral outgrowth assay. And when she compared baseline samples to those um, samples in the participants that stayed virally suppressed until week 12. She did find that with the, except, with the exception of one participant, there was a reduction of uh, intact reservoir size as measured by viral outgrowth assays, but it did not reach statistical significance. Um, but then two years later, um, in collaboration with Daniel Kaufman's group, um, when we look more at the aspect of this general stimulation of um, an adaptive immune response, what Julia Nissel um, found um, was when she did um, uh, activation-induced marker assays, 
um, she did find that in these participants that have been um, receiving an antibody intervention, she found that there was an increase in GAG specific in these HIV specific um, CD8 T cell responses. So um, um, some indicators that um, what the schematic um, might suggest could actually be true in these human clinical trials. So as a um, somewhat logical consequence of this clinical trial that I just introduced um, um, over the last few years, we um, performed a somewhat extended trial um, with a um, somewhat more complex um, study design. So I'm going to walk us through. Um, in this case, we had two groups of study participants. Again, these were pe people living with HIV who had been um, infected for quite some time. Um, instead of three antibody infusions, this time um, the study design involved seven antibody infusions over a dosing period of um, 20 weeks. Um, we had these two groups, so study participants were either randomized in group one, and in group one, study participants would be asked to stop taking their antiretroviral medication with the first day um, of the first antibody infusion, and then would stay off ART, um, would be followed weekly, um, and in case they um, a viral rebound would occur or they would meet ART reinitiation criteria, they would be um, uh, asked to start um, restart taking their medication. Uh, and group two was different uh, as such that um, our study participants, when they were randomized into group two, um, would stay on ART throughout the dosing period um, until week 26, until a second time point uh, and the second leukapheresis. And we would then ask them to enter a phase of analytical treatment interruption. They would be followed frequently uh, until they meet our initiation criteria and would be put back on ART. So this is um, the culmination and the heart and the soul, I think, of many, many years of work. Uh, and I don't want to go into too many details, but what you can see here in the first three rows and the upper three rows, um, these are individual plots over the follow-up period for um, group one participants. At the bottom row, you see our group two participants. Whenever you see a white background, that means these individuals were in analytical treatment interruption. When you see a gray background, and I hope you can see this on the screen, that means that they were um, on ART. The black curve um, represents the viral load measurements um, and the, the colored curves, um, blue and red, represent uh, um, serum levels of both those antibodies, 3BNC117 and 10-1074. What you might appreciate when you look at the first three rows, um, you can see that the majority of individuals in group one that entered analytical treatment interruption with the start of the antibody dosing uh, maintain viral suppression um, for more than 20 weeks. And um, just to point two examples out, we had two examples, 5106 um, at the top and 5120 here, who maintained viral suppression throughout our follow-up period uh, until week 48. Although the antibodies, as you can see here, and the colored um, curves um, decreased below levels that we would consider therapeutic. Um, one of the individuals, 5120, we are still able to follow up and we're coming, um, or we're over three years now, and this um, individual is still virally suppressed um, and um, is still not um, back on medication. At the bottom, you see our group two participants, you see that the, um, they're gray underlined in the beginning, so they stayed on ART throughout the dosing period and then went into analytical treatment interruption um, until they would meet our reinitiation criteria. So we were then very interested in um, uh, studying the HIV reservoir of these um, study participants. Uh, and as I mentioned, in our case, we used a near full length sequencing approach um, to study the reservoir in our um, BNAP intervention participants. And at the same time, we also looked at um, a parallel group um, of um, individuals, people living with HIV, who did not receive an intervention, but um, were available to us for serial blood collections. And overall, when we applied our reservoir measurements, we were able to recover um, close to 7,200 sequences, 900 of them being intact and um, close to 6,300 um, defective, so defective um, proval sequences. So next, when we then went on to um, quantify the reservoir size in our um, study participants, we did observe that in um, our study antibody treated group, we observed a moderate um, but significant decrease in the intact proviral frequency per million CD4 T cells. Uh, and we did not observe a similar decrease in the defective proviral compartment or um, in this parallel group of individuals who stayed on ART um, uh, but not, did not receive an intervention. 
Um, here I have to specify, like you can see in the upper panel, um, we focused this analysis on individuals who had been on um, suppressive art for at least seven years prior to the um, entry into our study. Uh, just as an explanation, if you remember um, one of my first slides um, in this in the study from Michael Peluso, where they were able to follow up um, uh, individuals up to 20 years, they saw a faster um, decay or a, a shorter half-life in uh, within the first seven years after art initiation than a much longer one um, after that. So in order to avoid um, any confounding here, we, um, we tried to restrict our analysis to the individuals who had been suppressed for at least seven years. We looked at two time points, so unfortunately, we're not um, able to reliably um, calculate a half-life here. But we did look at the relative change um, over time and saw that there was a relative change uh, within the intact proval compartment. And one advantage that, uh, at least in my opinion, our near full length sequencing approach gives us is that um, after sequence assembly, after herbal alignments, um, it allows us, once we have the sequence information, to really have a more granular view about different proval subtypes on a molecular level. And so we can really get a good overview about the viral um, proviral landscape and the composition of the reservoir. And so when we looked at this, um, uh, we did find again a, um, a change or a decrease in the relative representation of intact proviruses um, out of the total of proviruses recovered per participant in time point. Um, we saw a decrease over time that was significant. However, we did not see any of these changes among the proviral um, or defective proviral subtypes. And we also did not see this in the, um, inter in the parallel group that did not receive an intervention. And here I, I'd also like to point out, when you look at these um, defective proviral subtypes that we have highlighted in light blue and in pink, these are actually proviral genomes that span the entire 9KB um, genome but have some smaller defects, the ones that we call MSD, have some either deletions or um, mutations in the major splice donor, which um, we consider um, or what, which renders them defective because they are not able to functionally splice um, their RNA transcripts, or the non-functional ones, which are also 9KB genomes, um, but have some smaller insertion or deletions, which leads to frame shift mutations, and non-functional open reading frames, which um, renders them also non-functional. And I'm just saying this because, um, um, again, um, none of the reservoir assays are perfect, but especially for um, uh, near full length sequencing approaches, there is the question of PCR efficiency, which is, I think, a very legitimate one. But because these are, are represent 9KB genomes, um, I think uh, we believe that um, as an internal control in these PCR assays, they actually work, um, work well, and we do not see the same dynamics uh, among these genomes. So in summary, what we can say here is that in our um, um, clinical trial, we did observe that VNAP therapy was associated with a significant decrease in the intact proviral reservoir. Um, however, uh, and I'm not showing the plot here, but we did then take the next step and um, we need or our clinical readout in this clinical trial was the time to viral rebound. Um, and when we tried to correlate the size of the reservoir, changes in the size of the reservoir, we did not see a correlation with um, uh, time to viral rebound. So um, whatever we have observed, which is quite expected, but still it's important to say um, we did not see a correlation with um, a delay in viral rebound. So our clinical outcome um, um, would probably, in order to see an impact on this clinical outcome, um, this would probably require either um, much larger changes or also longer studies. One important um, and quick thing that I would like to mention, the, when we initially um, designed this study, we sought to um, shed light on the question if there's a difference if the dosing of the antibodies happens either in a period where ART is um, taken or when study participants are off ART. So when we did a subgroup analysis for group two, so these were the individuals who stayed on ART throughout the dosing period, we did see some similar directions of change in the, um, in the proviral landscape, however, this did not reach statistical significance, which might be due to um, the smaller number of participants. But I think this is a question that we have to remain open, but um, that definitely would be very important to answer. So in conclusion, immunotherapy with these two antibodies, BBNC117 and 10-1074, was associated with a decrease in the intact proviral reservoir. Um, but we have not observed a similar effect in the defective reservoir. 
So our hypothesis here would be that um, indeed antibody therapies could interfere with the clonal expansion or reservoir maintenance by targeting such dividing cells that, for example, are infected with um, an intact proviral genome um, that could potentially express viral proteins and antibodies could do this either directly or by enhancing um, CD8 T cell responses. However, again, um, our clinical readout was the time to viral rebound and we did not observe um, that the magnitude of the change in the reservoir size after BNF therapy um, would be sufficient to delay rebound. Um, so in, in perspective, I think, uh, and that's also something we're currently working on, longer and larger studies um, are warranted to really determine the immunological mechanisms uh, and allow us to define a more precise half-life of this intact reservoir in the context of antibody therapy. Um, this was an incredibly um, um, long study. Uh, I think we had this great session with uh, Michael Peluso, our study participants and our primary care physicians, um, which kind of illustrated how, how difficult these studies were, and especially in the context of, um, of COVID. So really um, many, many thanks to our study participants who are really um, um, the most important part of all these studies. Um, and many people to thank, uh, Marina Kaski, who's leading our clinical team, we are Michelle Nussenzweig, and the entire team at Rockefeller University. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Christian. Um, we will now open for questions from the floor. You can just step right up to the mic if you have any questions. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna. We have a couple of questions uh, online. So the first one is: Can BNAP reach all reservoirs, regardless of where they are? For example, can they cross the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, that's that's a very important question. So I should I, I should say that um, in our case, um, we also only looked at peripheral blood. So these were leukapheresis samples. Um, like, like Sabrina said, like earlier today, we heard the talk about the end of life studies. So um, it's it's a good it's an important question how different these um, reservoir um, or the reservoirs are within different tissues. Um, penetration of antibodies depends on um, on subclasses. Um, the, the penetration um, through the blood, blood brain barrier will, will not be very good. So that's that's a very good question. But again, we only looked at um, the peripheral blood. So um, it would be very interesting to look at other tissues too. But um, that's that's always a very, very um, difficult thing to do. Right, thank you. So the next question is, will the intervention require regular or repeated infusions? And in this case, what is the advantage of a long acting? Yeah, great question. Um, so in our context, we had seven antibody infusions, but these were um, versions of the antibodies that um, basically the regular versions that are not enhanced to increase the half-life uh, of these antibodies. We um, have been testing um, both those antibodies as a version that has a, a long-acting version. Uh, and we're currently planning the follow-up studies with the long-acting version that would then require less antibody infusions uh, and we we are still learning about the exact half-life of these long-acting versions, um, but that will be part of the study to try to find an answer if um, what would be needed to, um, how many infusions would be needed. Um, another two more questions. So I think I'll just join these two together. Um, did BNAPs increase CD8 T cell cytolytic activity and were the CD8 responses different between the groups? So, um, Again, we've seen this in the previous trial, so we would um, expect something similar to happen in this trial, but this is still ongoing, so I can't, I can't speak to our current results. Um, we have a wealth of um, samples from these participants and a wealth of questions that need to be answered, but um, these questions like um, increases in adaptive immune responses, um, potential vaccinal effects on autologous antibody responses, increases in breadth, what we've also seen before in the context of antibody therapy, these are all ongoing um, and, and we're, we're doing these experiments right now. All right, so we have a couple of questions from the floor. Uh, hi, excellent presentation. I was, uh, I have a naive question in fact concerning, do you have an hypothesis why intact proviruses might be more targeted than defective? 
Is it because with the BNABs, they are the only cells infected that could eventually uh, translate to the targeted uh, protein by the BNABs? Yeah, in a way, I think that is our hypothesis, but um, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we know that defective proviruses are not um, completely silent or could not um, have any form of production of proteins. So could it be that defective proviruses that, for example, have an open reading, reading frame for an envelope protein that uh, could be expressing envelope could be targeted by um, these antibodies that recognize, um, uh, that recognize uh, the envelope protein? That's a very good question, but um, I, I guess um, we'll we'll need more. So I, that's another thing that I think by the discussion, what are the reservoir assays? What is the perfect reservoir assay? I think um, my guess would be something that gives us the, um, the molecular information of a sequencing approach, but the throughput of a, uh, of a non-sequencing approach, something in the middle that gives us more information. We're trying to get as much sequence information as we can but I, my thinking is we're just still scratching on the on the very surface of this iceberg. Uh, and in order to try to get a big better picture, we probably need much more sequencing or much more information to really dig into these questions. What are the dynamics of, of defectives, of different types of defectives? Can there be viral expression that could be modulated or could modulate the immune response? I think these are very important. Right, so we have three more questions, so maybe we can keep the questions and answers short. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christian. It was a very good presentation. I was uh, more curious about the impact of the BNAPs on the induction of a proper immune response, uh, more into the aspect like training the immune response with the BNAPs because of the, fun the, fun the, fun the, the effector function that they can lead. What do you think that training in the early phase, because of course, mainly of the trials are made after a long period of, of art, and then you make the art interruption. What do you think that maybe uh, immune training in the early phase of the infection could lead maybe to a more, a higher decay of the reservoir in the long term? Yeah, I think especially for also the assessment of adaptive immune responses, I think the timing is extremely crucial. Um, so not only when we would give the antibodies early infection versus chronic infection, but also when do we measure, when do we really see an effect with our assays? That's an extremely important question. So probably also these, these activation effects might be earlier in the phase and not um, like towards the end of the antibody therapy. But um, um, uh, Ol Sogard with um, his team in Denmark has shown more recently that in the in in, in a, a different study design um, that when you give these antibodies more in an acute infection you also see increases in CD8 T cell responses or T cell responses in general. So I think that's a, that's a very important point: the timing of uh, where we are in the infection, but also when do we look. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Christian. Dennis Corbertino here. I think, you know, and I'm going to ask, <laughs> um, you know, and I'm glad you brought up CD8 T cells. Was there any role of protective HLAs uh, in the participants who controlled versus those who did not? Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Dennis. This is a great point. Um, yeah, we, and I, I, I learned a lot this morning also in this great, in these great sessions. Um, and it's it's very true. So we have these two long post-treatment controllers, 5106 and 5120, and one of them um, does have a protective HLA um, B57 type. And um, um, like you um, mentioned to me, on, and we heard about this morning too, um, HLA B44 might play a role too. And it's indeed like one of the other ones, 5120, um, has a um, protective, what I now learned, protective HLA type B44. Um, if this is only, or if this is, um, there's an interconnection with antibody therapy, if this could be um, augmenting this um, effect of post-treatment control, I think that's also a very interesting question. And for that, we need more post-treatment controllers that we can really have a good control for that. Thanks so much. Great talk. All right. Last question. Did the rebound viruses show genetic diversity and were these of the resistant variants? Yes, so I did, um, for time's sake, not go into rebound viruses, but we did quite an um, um, in-depth um, classification of rebound viruses in our case. 
And we did see that um, these rebound viruses generally um, acquired 10-1074 um, resistance mutations, so against one of our antibodies. There's a slightly different half-life of both these antibodies, which leads to a period of monotherapy for 10-1074. And in these monotherapy um, um, moments, uh, the virus is pretty capable of acquiring resistance mutations to this monotherapy of 10-1074. Detected in almost all of our rebound viruses, we've detected um, um, uh, escape mutations to one of the antibodies, which is different to um, and, uh, to resistance to medication. But it's um, in, in for our questions of BNAP therapy, these are very important. All right, that's it. Thank you so much again, Dr. Christian, for your amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. This is quite a, a change in topic uh, with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Barr, who is a social and behavioral scientist administrator at the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. Uh, Dr. Barr background in, is in community-centered research, HIV treatment advocacy, and reproductive justice. Uh, Dr. Barr led interdis interdis oh, that's a hard one. interdisciplinary and cross-sector projects to increase uh, women's engagement in clinical research and served on the faculties of University of Maryland, Baltimore County and Towson University. Dr. Barr, please. Thank you. Um, so my conflict of interest is that the views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the National Institutes of Health or the United States government. Um, and my co-author who is on the Zoom today, uh, Richard Jeffries has his uh, disclosures here. And I'm really excited to be presenting this work on behalf of our team. Um, so I know that you are all familiar with the geographic distribution of HIV shown here as WHO data um, with the prevalence of HIV among adults. This is from 2016. And the work that I'll be sharing with you today is from a set of landscape analyses that Richard and I did looking at the cure related research field in 2018 and 2019. And so I offer this slide as a visual comparison to the geographic distribution of cure related studies in 2019. Um, and for this landscape analysis, um, just a bit of brief background, Richard and I uh, utilized the, the listing that Treatment Action Group maintains of cure-related studies, and we um, scoured the registry entries for these studies and also sent a survey to the PIs and their designees for all of these studies. Um, and we asked a number of questions, and we're very grateful for the uh, time and answers that those researchers shared with us. Um, and one thing that we found is that the overwhelming majority of cure-related research is happening in the United States, which is not where the overwhelming majority of HIV is. Um, we also looked at year-on-year -year comparisons of the distribution of cure research to see if maybe there was a big spike, and there was not. Um, the geographic distribution in yellow is 2018 and blue is 2019, and the studies did not move a lot geographically. Um, so this was not a one-off event. Um, and so uh, we heard a lot this morning already today about why geographic diversity matters in terms of subtype, in terms of racial, ethnic diversity, in terms of um, just general diversity and cure-related research. Um, We've also heard today that women remain dramatically underrepresented um, really in every field of HIV research. So not just cure, but um, the paper by Kerno that was cited earlier does a nice breakdown of when women's underrepresentation. Data from um, a project led by Laura Smeaton shows that um, this is not due to screen failures, right? It's not that women are screening out of studies more often than men, um, but it perhaps maybe that women are not asked to participate as often as men. Um, additionally, data on race and ethnicity is underreported, um, and when that data is reported, diversity along the lines of race and ethnicity are really um, suboptimal. Um, there's a nice paper uh, led by Roberts et al. that's looking at the published studies in 2019 from the Martin Delaney Collaboratories, and they found that just 51% of studies coming out of the collaboratories in 2019 reported any demographic data at all. Um, and when reported, the data um, does not reflect the diversity of 
HIV prevalence. A similar analysis was led by AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition, looking at pharmaceutical studies over the period of 2010 through 2020 that um, also found really uh, woefully inadequate reporting and diversity. There was a nice review paper in 2016 led by Sarah Gianella, who I think is also on the Zoom, um, and Katie Godfrey, looking at some of the barriers to a cure for women. We heard a lot about that this morning, and so I don't need to belabor um, that point now. But there are a number of both sex and gender-related factors that will be important to consider when developing a cure that will work for women, uh, cisgender, transgender women, and individuals assigned female at birth. So it um, will be important to have targeted enrollment of women in clinical trials, as well as careful sex-based analysis in order to really understand both the biologic mechanisms, but also the social determinants that will make HIV cure perhaps different for women than for men. And so in this context, um, there are a number of policy considerations to consider for cure-related research. As the overwhelming majority of cure studies are happening in the United States, I start with the NIH. Um, there's a long history of NIH policies related to inclusion as far back as 1993, um, which is commonly referred to as the inclusion policy, but perhaps more relevant for cure-related research, which tends to be in early phase and um, animal studies. Uh, the 2016 Sex as a Biological Variable Policy ex uh, outlines the NIH expectation that sex as a biological variable will be factored into research design analysis and reporting um, in all studies involving vertebrate animals and humans. And so um, over the last six years, we have seen some movement on the implementation and uptake of that policy, as well as the 2017 Inclusion Across the Lifespan Policy, which um, require studies to enroll individuals of all ages and report de-identified participant data. However, the um, NIH is not the only funder in town or the only federal agency in the world. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight some additional um, policy considerations. So Horizon Europe uh, has an expectation that gender will be integrated by default into awards. Um, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research has a sex and gender-based analysis plus policy, um, which articulates its expectation for intersectional analyses um, to be brought to research that considers sex, gender, age, race, ethnicity, and a number of other social determinants of health. And so within this context, I think, um, you know, it's often, uh, there's often noted a disconnect between policy and practice, and I think there's probably a lot of levers to push to move things around there, um, but I did want to provide that context. And to move back to the landscape analysis and see sort of how we, um, we as a field are adhering to these policies and the ethical imperatives to really enroll participants who will benefit from research into research, um, I want to talk through this table and the table on the next slide. So. In the survey of researchers, we asked them to report the current enrollment in their studies. So this was studies that were um, in many cases open, had just started enrolling or were currently enrolling. And uh, the number in parentheses in the fat column is the number of researchers who were able to provide that data. So 60 uh, respondents to our survey told us how many people were currently enrolled in their studies. 31 people told us how many of the people enrolled in their studies were female. So that was 16.7% of um, participants. We also asked how many of their participants were women because sex and gender are not the same thing. Um, and we did receive a response that 18.5% of currently enrolled participants in 2019 were women. 1.4 participants enrolled in open studies in 2019 um, had identified themselves as transgender to the research team, and 6.7% of participants were over 50. And so, you know, this is, um, I think, similar to other findings that have been documented elsewhere. We also asked about uh, race and ethnicity. You may see in the top section of this table with the white background that 74.6% of participants were Asian. I would like to call your attention to the asterisk, um, which um, explains that 617 of the 629 Asian participants were enrolled in one large Thai study, and the data in the gray table at the bottom excludes that Thai study and um, brings the percentage of Asian participants to 5.5%. Uh, 
with 53.4% white, 32.4% black, and 11.9% Hispanic. So this data is from 2019, and um, Richard led a really nice analysis looking at what has happened to date. Um, and this is ongoing and will continue to be updated. And so um, for this, we have looked at all of the results that have been presented and published since the start of 2018. Um, so this is just the data that has been reported by researchers. Um, and of the presentations and publications that reported the demographics of their participants, there were 4,293 participants whose sex was reported. 79.5% were male, and we have crossed the 20% threshold. 20.5% of participants were female. Um, 13 participants were reported as transgender and two were report reported as non-binary. In terms of race or ethnicity, I'd like to call your attention to the um, difference between 2,152 participants whose race or ethnicity was reported and the 4,400 total participants. So that's about 21, 2,300 participants whose race or ethnicity was not reported. Um, but when it was reported, 60.1% of participants were white. And so this information in detail with links to the publications and presentations um, will be made available as a downloadable and continually updated Excel file via the TAG website. Um, so I encourage folks to take a look at that um, as your interest calls you to. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was a series of focus groups that Treatment Action Group convened in late 2021 and early 2022. There were two focus groups with US and UK based advocates and two with researchers also US and UK based or European based primarily. Um, and just to pull out some of the key findings, we um, had asked how how to do better with diversity was the overarching question there. And for the advocate perspectives, four themes really came out. First was with the research agenda. We've heard this many times today. It's important to integrate socio-behavioral research early and often, and to move away from the framework of only recruiting and enrolling and designing studies for folks who have been early diagnosed and early treated. There was also a real sense among the advocates that advocates need to do a better job of building internal advocacy infrastructure, um, creating diversity within our own communities and training newer advocates to feel um, empowered to speak when they are at tables. Uh, community advocates encourage researchers to shift their paradigms around community engagement from a box to check to something that's actually important to driving the scientific agenda and called for funders to increase support for community engagement, that it's not um, something that should, um, from the advocate's perspective, be done for free. Some quotes here, 30 years and we are making the same demands. The divide is widening between research and community. And if a trial doesn't have enough people of color and women for significant information to be obtained, then they need to stop the trial until they do. That should be the order of the day. So to highlight some of the um, major takeaways from the focus groups with researchers, uh, similar themes emerged with a, a few differences. So in terms of studies, uh, there was a really lovely suggestion to build, right? So we know a lot of these studies are small phase one studies enrolling like eight people, um, and that's gonna be impossible to really, um, to be powered to discover or explore sex differences. However, um, one solution could be to build planned diversity powered enrollment increases so that if an interim analysis in these small studies looks promising, the study automatically expands and enrolls enough folks to be powered to explore those differences. The researchers really um, articulated a strong desire for the sites to have dedicated staff with protected time to be able to engage with diverse populations. Um, the researchers are also frustrated by the sort of helicopter research and the in and out, we need you to enroll in our study, see you later. Um, the researchers felt that the big networks could do um, more to increase communication and collaboration between the networks and small sites that might not be network affiliated um, to really ensure that those collaborations are maintained. And researchers also expressed their real commitment to continue engaging in outreach and education to build trust. And one quote here, compared to 10 years ago, recruitment has become more difficult. The trials have become more difficult. ATIs really take part of the potential study population out of the equation. And echoing a comment from the previous slide, we keep talking about the same things over and over again. We need resources, we need staff dedicated to this, and we need time. 
So the next steps on the focus group is um, to convene additional focus groups with advocates from Africa, Asia, and South America, which will be happening this summer and fall, as well as a meeting to explore data sharing and ways to um, build some infrastructure to support those collaborations, as well as an updated landscape analysis of cure-related research um, in 2022, which will take place this fall. I have two conclusions that I'd like to share. Um, the first should hopefully not be a surprise, um, but participant demographics and cure-related research do not reflect the demographics of people living with HIV. Researchers and advocates are supportive of efforts to increase diversity, and researchers and advocates perceive existing research infrastructures as influential as either enhancing or limiting diversity in cure-related research. And so, you know, I think um, it's not so much of a talking at one another, but more of a working together. Um, just to close with some acknowledgments, of course, the Treatment Action Group and the focus group participants, Mike McCune has been a big supporter of this work and um, the conference organizers for allowing me to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barr, for this uh, very interesting presentation. We'll take questions from the audience, and I remind you that uh, you can still ask questions on the chat. Michael, you're going to the microphone. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing this. Um, my question is really more of a comment based on something that we've learned through the NIH. When they funded the COVID Prevention Trials Network, that network showed that when they were given funding to do outreach and recruitment, that they could reach those populations. Um, so do you know of any ways that we can be doing that through other networks that might need that funding? Or do you know if there's any mechanisms? How can we get the money that we need to do this to the places that it needs to go? That is a fantastic question. And you know, I, I can assure you that the NIH is committed to good financial stewardship of its taxpayer dollars. And you know, I think um, it's important to reinforce the message that this is something that matters and to um, reinforce that message to the people who are writing grants that are being submitted, right? And so, um, and also to people who are reviewing grants. And so, you know, the, the beauty of peer review is that it's your peers who are reviewing it. And so if your peers think that something is important, they, or, you know, they might notice if it's missing. So, um, I think that NIH is well aware of the successes of the CoVPN and um, would love suggestions for how to replicate that. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Kind of a related question. I, I think funders kind of hold the uh, the purse strings, and if you put that in the RFA, that you have to have statistically significant numbers of people in the trial to begin with. People will find the ways to uh, to recruit them. We've been fighting, as you know, that this battle with the ACTG for a long time. But I think it comes from the top down. And also conferences like this and publications, that they do the same if there are studies that don't have enough numbers of women um, to, not, to not give them um, the spotlight, I think would be uh, hugely influential. So I think there's a lot that these communities could be doing to, to, to move the needle on that. Yeah, and thanks for that comment. I'd, I'd like to note a number of publications are really taking um, a leading role in uh, calling for adherence to things like the Sager guidelines and transparency and data reporting. Um, I know the Lancet publications, I think the Cell publications are um, taking real steps because it, you know, there are a number of forces at work, right? It's like, is the researcher enrolling people? Is the funder encouraging it to be a diverse study? Is the publication or the conference accepting the abstract, even though it doesn't say like, you know, interventions towards the cure in men because it was all men enrolled, right? <laughs> so like, are we actually um, creating a community at all of these levels that is um, adhering to best practices and policies? Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Yeah. Alberto Bosque, yours was in the university and I can actually is kind of piggybacking what he said because I mean, it's my experience on trying to publish research, although in vitro and basic research on HIV by using uh, cells from either men, female, or different, that actually journals don't care. And even reviewers, sometimes, if you don't find a difference, it seems that it, they seem that it's relevant. And I think that it has to be some way where, you know, even with NIH, we'll kind of explain that, you know, it, it seems that we need to find a difference between the populations. And sometimes when you don't find it, they actually, it actually gets like, you know, um, 
taken away. So I think I think it you know I think it is it, it is really important to address in all the levels from the clinical point of view, but also from the basic science point of view. And I think everybody should be on board on trying to increase the representation of samples to do all the studies because one of the things that we see is that the variability among different samples is is huge, and we are not looking into that. And you know we always have a lot of trouble trying to publish when we just don't find differences, even from the basic science point of view. So I think it is important to also get journals on board on this. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think um, even within the category of sex, right, that's not like a discrete two bucket category. So there's a number of elements of sex that are important and um, there's not gonna be a difference all the time. And I think, um, you know, just from a feminist perspective, arguing, well, I don't, I don't wanna be like too off my, um, official duties here. But, you know, I, I think there are a number of ways in which bodies are different. And there are also a number of ways in which bodies are not different and um, diverting too much resources to finding differences. You, you don't need to look for sex differences every time. You, you just need to enroll a diverse and representative sample, right? You need to enroll participants who look like the population and are like the population. And if there are differences, when there are differences, if you are looking for them, you will find them. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. So we'll move on to the next session of new strategies in HIV cure. Um, just as a reminder, the questions for the speakers will be after the third speaker. So next up, we have Chris Peterson, who is a research associate professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine and a staff scientist in the lab of Dr. Hans Peter Kim at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle. His work focuses on gene therapy approaches to enhance the anti-HIV properties of various hematopoietic subsets, including T cells, B cells, and stem cells. The majority of his work is conducted in non-human primate models, which are designed to inform therapies for infectious diseases like HIV, as well as genetic diseases and cancer. Um, Chris will be joining us online. Um, right, over to you, Chris. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and especially to the organizers and technical staff for allowing me to, to virtual in today. So I'm going to tell you um, a new story that, that I think follows on the theme of, of using CAR T cells to target the, the persistent HIV reservoir. And again, this is work that, that I've done in our non-human primate model of, of HIV persistence out here at Seattle at the Fred Hutch. So the, the theme, of course, here is, is CAR T cells. And, and CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. This is just a way that we can genetically modify a T cell so it can recognize any target of interest. Um, CAR T cells have, have gained a lot of notoriety and have had a great amount of success for leukemia and, and specifically um, for B cell leukemia. And, and so what we're interested in doing is, is simply redirecting that CAR T cell. So in, instead of recognizing a leukemia cell, it's able to recognize an HIV infected cell. A lot of you in the audience have, have heard me to, tell a story previously about some of the differences between how CAR T cells work for cancer and how they work for HIV. Um, and this is all summarized in, in a publication from a couple of years ago where we drew from the, the literature to show that cancer is obviously a disease of, of cellular overproliferation. There's a lot of cancer cells for, for a CAR T cell to look at. And each of, those CAR T, each of those cancer cells is going to have a lot of antigen. That's what the CAR T cell uses to recognize and, and kill that target. In stark contrast for HIV, we have to meet a higher bar. And, and that's because of the fact that in a person living with HIV that's stably suppressed on antiretroviral therapy, there's going to be very few cells that are, that are latently and persistently infected. And the amount of antigen, namely the envelope protein from the virus, that's expressed at the surface of those cells is, is going to be low or, or potentially not even there. It's very hard to detect and quantify that. So what we've previously shown is, is by using a cell-based envelope boost, essentially a vaccine, we can really prime these CAR T cells so that they're ready to respond when they can see a, a truly 
uh, infected cell starting to reactivate, either with latency reversing agents or an art interruption or, or other processes um, that we're actively um, investigating. So that story is already published. Um, and, and I won't talk about that today. What, what I'd like to do is, is actually circle back to something that, that was really at the basis of, of what I studied when I joined um, the lab here at, at the Fred Hutch and, and something that was really covered really nicely this morning, which is the, the interplay between cancer and HIV and, and what we can learn from participants that are involved in some of these trials uh, that, that are people living with HIV who have an underlying malignancy. So I won't go over this in, in any detail because I think this was covered very, very nicely this morning, other than to say that we believe that the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation that um, Timothy Brown received in his allogeneic stem cells and Adam Cassiejo received, as well as the Dusseldorf patient, the New York patient, and what we'll hear about, I think, at, at the meeting this, this weekend, the City of Hope patient all received, was really key for success there. Um, what we and, and others have shown in non-human primate models is that there are a number, there are a number of correlates um, of, of cure in those patients. This was also something that was touched on this morning. But what we've shown is that, for example, the conditioning regimen, which is used to deplete those, those leukemia cells, but also could deplete the viral reservoir, is effective, but it also takes away some of the uh, HIV-specific immune cells. So we think that's sort of a double-edged sword. There's a graft versus reservoir effect that has been hypothesized for what went on here, similar to a graft versus leukemia effect that, that is, has been shown in, in uh, cancer patients. But again, the toxicities there are something that are going to require a lot of further study and refinement. So that really leaves the, the idea of these infection resistant, in, in the case of these patients, Delta 32 um, donor cells that, that played a key role. So I bring this up again, just as a highlight of, of what we can learn um, in, in participants who are living with HIV and are also being treated um, for an underlying malignancy. So the question that, that we wanted to address in, in the, the data that I'm going to show you today is how does B-cell depletion impact HIV persistence? And, and for a piece, person with a B-cell leukemia, um, you can imagine that they're going to go through a targeted therapy that's going to get rid of those B-cells, uh, those leukemic B-cells, but there's also going to be a loss of, of normal B-cells. And in a person living with HIV, if we use a B-cell targeted CAR T-cell, which again has been shown to work quite well in, in the cancer field, um, how, how is that going to impact? And, and we're doing that in our non-human primate model um, of HIV persistence. So why are we interested in B-cells? Um, really, really, the work that I'm going to show you today is, is the result of really pioneering studies by Liz Kotick and Pam Skinner, and also by Afa McCoy and Lewis Picker, showing that B-cell follicles within lymph nodes and other secondary lymphoid tissues are a, a highly likely place or a primary place where the virus may hide out um, during a persistent antiretroviral therapy. So that's schematized here, just showing that in these B-cell follicles here in blue, there's obviously a lot of B-cells in that location. There are also some HIV-infected T-cells, specifically T-follicular helper cells, but then some of the HIV-specific CD8 cells that could kill those cells in yellow are excluded from that space. And so they can't get in, they can't clear those cells out, and they're able to persist over time. And this is what we refer to as a sanctuary. So the hypothesis for what we did here was to use CAR T cells in a different way. In, instead of directly targeting virus infected cells, we wanted to ask the question, if we deplete B cells, um, what would happen to this viral sanctuary in lymph nodes? So if we start with a, a B cell follicle that looks like this, and we've got a few of these HIV infected cells in yellow that are hiding out in that follicle, if we can disrupt that follicle and, and essentially let those uh, orange cells, those CD8 T cells in to find those HIV infected cells, could we then reform that B cell follicle having cleared out those latently and, and persistently um, infected cells uh, within that sanctuary site? So this is all data that that was done in my group within the lab led by um, John Bui, uh, MD Fellow, and Carly Stark uh, postdoc. So this was a study that we did in pigtail macaques that were infected with SHIV, which is a simian human immunodeficiency virus. It's one of the uh, primary viruses that we use to model HIV infection in monkeys. Um, the, the full scope of the study, I won't get into all the data today, but included a, a cohort of 11 animals in three groups. One is where we looked at where these CAR T cells traffic 
um, specifically, are they getting to these B cell follicles in the first place? And the answer is yes. Um, and I'll show you that data in a minute. And then most of the data I'll show you today is comparing two groups of four animals. Um, the first group was an uninfected cohort that received CD20 CAR T cells. And the second was a, a SHIV infected and ART suppressed cohort that went on, underwent the identical um, CD20 CAR T cell therapy. So the, the data I'll show you here is in, is in black for that uninfected cohort that received the CD20 CAR T cells and in red for the SHIV infected ART suppressed cohort. Um, what you can see on the left is that we get a dramatic spike in, in total peripheral T cell counts after these CD20 CAR T cells are infused. Um, I'm not showing you the data here, but within the CD3 compartment in peripheral blood, up to 50% of those T cells express this CAR molecule at, at the peak of expansion that you see there within the first couple weeks after the, the CAR T cells are put in. So these, these cells are incredibly potent. Um, I, I want to mention here that this is not a model of, of B-cell leukemia per se. We're, we're putting these into uninfected animals that are otherwise healthy and SHIV-infected art suppressed animals, and we're just looking for depletion of normal B-cells. And, and that's an important contrast to draw relative to clinical studies in, in, in people living with HIV with a B-cell leukemia. But in the context of the model that we have here, what we can show is, is that B-cell counts drop to undetectable levels. And in our uninfected animals tend to rebound coordinate with when the, the, the CAR T cells tend to wane. So within a month to a month and a half after the CAR T cells go away, B cell counts re rebound. Um, one of the interesting things we've, we found straight off is that in our model of suppressed HIV infection using SHIV here, the, the timing and the magnitude of that B cell rebound um, in these uh, animals was, was significantly delayed. So there was quite a lag in, in the ability of these B cells to rebound in the background of, of suppressed infection. In terms of what the viral loads look like, um, these four animals that were infected with SHIV and suppressed by ART are shown here. Um, we had two animals that, that uh, established a, a very steady viral set point before we started antiretroviral therapy, which is the gray box. We had two animals also that were uh, different definitions of natural controllers. So the, the bottom right animal is sort of the prototypical natural controller that we see for the shiv where the viral load drops to undetectable levels and, and mostly remains there uh, within 10 weeks after infection. We have other animals that kind of bounce all over the place. And that's what this uh, upper right animal is. It goes down below the limit of detection and comes back up and goes back down. So there's there's a continuum of, of virus control that we see the, with, with these shivs. I, I, I think that's consistent with what would be seen in, in uh, patient participant populations. And so we wanted to compare all these different animals um, in this particular study. The white arrow is when the animals received CAR T cell infusions. And then the dagger is, is when they went to endpoint necropsy. So looking in the lymph nodes from these animals, obviously the, the, the primary um, goal that we had was to disrupt these B cell follicles in, in various secondary lymphoid tissues. Um, this is data hot off the press that, that, that Carly just generated showing that when we look in uh, tissues that are collected longitudinally in our animals two and four weeks after the CAR T cells are introduced, um, that's shown here in, in these first two columns, that we've lost that lymph node B cell follicle architecture, um, both in lymph nodes and in spleen. But we look again about a year later when B cell counts have recovered and those uh, CAR T cells are gone, you can see that these B cell follicles um, by ADCD20 immunohistochemistry have reformed and are quite robust. So this is all consistent with what we expect, that we can put these CD20 CAR T cells in, we deplete, CAR T, we deplete B cell targets in peripheral blood and in tissues. And so the next question is, is, is what's the effect on the viral reservoir? So there's a lot of data to look at here, um, but this is an assay that, that we've really developed over the years to look broadly across our, our animals at a panel of 25 different tissues. And, and so at necropsy in all these animals, uh, we look and, and ask whether the viral reservoir size has changed by some pretty quick um, first pass assays. On the top is total shiv RNA per million cell equivalents. And on the bottom is, is total shiv DNA per million cell equivalents. And what you can see is, is that with the exception of, of a couple of tissues, we see a, a significant increase in the amount of uh, viral RNA in jejunum. Um, we see a significant decrease in viral DNA and spleen. Really for the most part, we're not seeing any difference. Um, this is, 
obviously disappointing. The, the hypothesis here is that we would just eradicate everything and, and only see viral DNA in our four control animals that were SHIV infected and aren't suppressed. Those are in gray. And in our colored circles, we would see um, no viral RNA or DNA, but it doesn't look like the, the CD20 based CAR T cell based disruption of the B cell follicles had a huge impact on, on reservoir size, at least by um, these, these first pass metrics. So the, the conclusions then from the, the study is, is that the CD20 CAR T cells that we uh, tested out in our monkey model function comparably, both in uninfected animals and, and SHIV infected art suppressed hosts. Um, this is consistent with a surprisingly limited amount of cl clinical data looking at CAR T cell therapy in, in people living with HIV. And, and one of the themes that I like to get across is I think there's a lot more to be learned. Uh, we saw that, that SHIV remained well suppressed during the CAR T cell expansion. You might imagine that by depleting all these B cells, including virus specific B cells, we might see a reactivation of the virus, even in the presence of ART, but we did not. So the, the, the viremia in these animals uh, stayed well suppressed. Um, we did see an impaired B cell recovery following the CAR T cell treatment in the, the SHIV infected ART suppressed animals, which maybe isn't surprising based on the ongoing immune dysfunction that we know is associated with suppressed infection. And most importantly, we didn't see any substantial impact of B cell follicle disruption on virus persistence in, in a panel of 25 um, different tissues that we looked at. So I, I think this is a theme that many of you have seen before. Um, the, the, the thought that we could just reveal these lightly infected cells to the immune system, maybe that would be enough to clear them and that doesn't seem to be the case. And so the direction that we're going is to combine such mechanisms where we can reveal these sanctuaries to the immune system with a more enhanced immune response. And we're doing that in a number of different ways in the lab right now. We have funded projects looking at virus-specific CAR T cells as well as antibody-engineered B cells in the monkey model. And for both of those, we're, we're interested in the cell-based antigen boosting approach that I mentioned to you at the top. We think that it's going to be very important to supplement the amount of antigen that these animals' cells can see so that those cells are ready to respond to recrudescing um, infected cells. Uh, the last thing that I think is really important to note is, is the question of how B-cell depletion approaches in a person living with HIV that's undergoing treatment for B-cell leukemia, to my knowledge, is mostly unanswered. And there's gonna, obviously going to be an increasing uh, number of people living with HIV that are going to need to undergo these malignancy therapies. And asking questions about what impact that has on the virus, I think, is, is largely um, unanswered and, and is a really important area to address. So... For, for the community summary, I, I think what we wanted to do here was try and reveal HIV infected cells to the immune system. Uh, we were trying to break up these tissue sites where the, those HIV infected cells hide out and see if that was enough to have those cells eliminated by um, the existing antiviral immune system. And, and that did not seem to be the case. Uh, how this is related to CURE is that I, I think this teaches us the lesson that we're gonna need to not only reveal those cells to the immune system, but make the immune system better at seeing them and clearing them. So that we're interested in working on both of those angles in, in our preclinical model. Um, I think this also, in terms of why to be excited, I think CAR T cells are gonna be useful not only to directly target the virus, but to understand more what the, the requirements are going to be to clear out latent reservoirs, in this case in tissues, by um, disrupting these B cell follicles. So, uh, I'll leave it there and, and highlight all the people in the lab that have supported this work, especially John and, and Carly, who generated all the data that you just saw and our so support from the National Primate Research Center out here in, in Seattle and our collaborators and, and funding sources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. We will take questions at the end. We already questions in the chat, but again, at the end of the session, uh, we will take all of them. So I will introduce our next speaker, uh, Leish and Lovu is professor of immunology in medicine at Well Cornell Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. After completing medical training, he received his PhD in immunology from Tohoku University in Japan and pursued postdoctoral training at the University of California, San Francisco. His research is dedicated to confronting the challenges of HIV and aging and has developed specific ex expertise and strategies to prevent, slow, or eliminate organ-specific complications. And today, Lish will tell us about uh, LOC 
uh, strategies, right? Block and lock. Thank Eric Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and really a great pleasure to be here. And thank the organizers for allowing us to talk about a new strategy for Cure. Um, I was also glad to see everybody after a long time, and I was worried I was going to lose my voice um, chatting with everybody. But uh, I'm going to tell you a, a strategy for, for Cure that we have now been embarking on uh, based on the block, lock, and excise as part of the NIH-funded uh, Martin Delaney Collaboratories. I'm speaking on behalf of two of our other uh, team members, Melanie Ott and Susanna Valente. Uh, and it's part of the HIV obstruction by programmed epigenetics and, and excision. Uh, see if this works. These are my conflicts. Uh, should mention those. So our scientific program really stems a, a pro, a, an approach looking at blocking by inhibiting HIV transcription uh, and a lock approach where we hope we can keep the virus blocked without uh, therapy and an excision approach where we want to inactivate uh, the proviral DNA in the genome. And we're using both epigenomic and genomic approaches uh, to permanently inactivate uh, HIV. So really for the, for the community, you know, our goal is really try to take advantage of endogenous retroviruses that are relics that we have already in our body. And these uh, retroviruses invade our genome and they progressively decay. Some of them uh, actually do not get reactivated, but most of them remain inactive in this state. And we hope that we can use these new techniques that we've been developing as a, as a group really to accelerate HIV's natural uh, path to an endogenous uh, retrovirus. So we're very fortunate um, that we have um, actually got 12 sites as part of the HOPE Collaboratory in five continents. I think there was a nice discussion about how we should try to in initiate cure trials uh, globally. As I mentioned, we have uh, three members in our team, uh, Melanie Art from the Glasser Institutes in San Francisco, and Susanna Valente at the University of Florida. And we've actually got 24 uh, total principal investigators and some of them here in Canada as well uh, across the globe. Uh, so our scientific uh, program really stems on thinking about the active uh, virus. I think um, we had a really great uh, opening session today by Sabrina really telling us about the viral uh, uh, transcriptional process of latent viruses and, and active viruses. And most viruses are active. Uh, in an active state, and it sort of goes back and forth between a latent stage, and we're really interested in trying to drive this into a silenced uh, approach, uh, where we may be prevent the virus from reactivating uh, when art is seized. Uh, the hope is also to bring uh, a, th a fourth stage to this process of excision, and the hope we can excise this uh, remaining uh, virus and sort of lead to uh, its complete eradication. So just to give you some background about the active state of the virus, this is really driven by the HIV TAT promoter, uh, TAT protein, which binds to this uh, super elongation complex. And together this uh, drives activation. We're really interested in inhibiting uh, the activity of TAT. Um, and the host uh, RNA polymerase is an area that we think we can target the host. And we have a number of epigenetic approaches in our lab that we've been using to target the host to silence the virus, but also using uh, strategies to target TAT directly uh, th uh, through the virus to, to lead to, um, to a latent stage. So once you get into a latent stage, if TAT is removed, uh, you're able to get um, at least uh, the promoter sitting in a paused uh, state uh, on, the, on the polymerase and the, the paused state on the promoter. And we hope to develop targets that will target the polymerase, but also recruit repressors to this stage thereby allowing the virus hopefully to remain uh, silenced. And then uh, the hope here, we can actually have uh, histone or DNA methylation marks will access this site, and this would lead to a permanent uh, silenced state. So we're really interested in trying to drive a silenced uh, virus and then hopefully come in with um, new strategies to alter the genome sequences of the virus uh, through uh, interesting gene editing changes that we hope to, to initiate to permanently change uh, this virus and hopefully end up in a state of complete um, uh, silencing and then excision of the virus. So we hope that with the excised virus, there will really be a permanent uh, approach to HIV eradication. So uh, as part of the program, we really have uh, worked with the NIH guidance on having three research foci. So the first research foci, which is led by Susanna Valente and uh, Warner Green at the Gladstone Institute, um, and, and several members of, of our program really hope to define HIV silencing by targeting both host and viral uh, factors. Uh, our hypothesis, uh, really stemming from a lot of work in HIV transcription within the program, is to see whether HIV transcription and chromatin structures 
uh, can actually offer unique targets for, for silencing. Uh, we have about four goals to achieve that. The first goal really to identify host regulators and we've got some really interesting uh, data to identify interesting uh, targets that can repress HIV through uh, a DCAS9 integration into the promoter, thereby pulling in regions to silence uh, uh, the virus. Um, we also want to learn from the endogenous retroviruses. Uh, you know, they've been very successful in silencing um, the, the, these viruses through crab and zinc finger domains. We want to study those and see how they're able to uh, suppress the virus, but also in some cases reactivate and see how we can learn from those processes to uh, adopt them for HIV silencing. Uh, the third goal here is to define uh, TAT in better detail and identify other targets for silencing. Uh, and we've got a number of strategies uh, to look at that uh, in the program. And finally, when you do introduce the silenced uh, approaches uh, to silence the provirus, we want to use a number of omics assays to look at these individual cells at the single cell level, really to identify how these cells are being silenced in individual cells. And in cells that don't get silenced, you know, we were able to characterize those features. Uh, so just to give you an example of some of those processes uh, from the Water Green Lab, they've been able to show repressor fusion proteins that have been bound to, um, to, the, to guide RNAs. And they've been able to show with these CRISPR eye screens, uh, identify, as you can see, um, an LTR region with this 337 compound is able to suppress efficiently HIV transcription in these cell lines, these are JLAT cells. And if you reactivate them with panabinostat or prostratin, you actually uh, do see continued suppression uh, with these particular uh, proteins. So we're very excited to move these proteins further forward into, the, uh, into our strategy uh, for HIV transcriptional blocks. Uh, we have a second research foci, which I'm leading together with Nadia Rohn, who's here with us. And in fact, it was the first time I've actually seen her. We've been doing Zoom for several years. Uh, and, and many members here, and our newest member, Brian Egan, who's joined the program, uh, really to develop the next generation of HIV silencing approaches. Uh, our hypothesis here, um, this is working, is really to find where the viral rebound is suppressed with silencing promoting agents, these spars, which we are trying to identify after art is ceased that we hope to prevent uh, any reactivation. Uh, we want to try to do this in vivo. So the hope is we can identify potential candidate uh, silencing promoting agents that we can find individuals that are on art that are uh, actually taking these agents and then try to see what impact this has had to the reservoir, both in blood and also in tissues. Uh, we're also, uh, as a second goal for this uh, program, a uh, three goal program is to develop novel silencing promoting agents. Uh, we're looking at finding ways that we can uh, identify novel TAT inhibitors, uh, but also identify um, novel um, uh, specific activators of the promoter that we could actually use as well. And finally, the third goal is to apply sequence specific silencing promoting agents actually in vivo and identify the best uh, process that we can impact HIV transcription. And I talked about some of those such as the CRISPR uh, off and CRISPR I programs as well. Uh, just to give you a, a snapshot of some of the targets that we have found. So this is some work from the Valente lab. Uh, they've actually been able to identify some very specific TAT inhibitors. And we're very excited to work with these compounds. Uh, the exciting thing about these compounds is not only do they are uh, uh, able to degrade TAT, but you actually get some durable silencing. Here you can see in this figure three compounds when you actually stop ART, you actually see maintenance of suppression of, of GAG mRNA in these uh, cell lines. Uh, and more interestingly, when you try to reactivate, you actually see continued suppression uh, of, of transcription after 12 days post-treatment with these TAT inhibitors. So we're very excited to, to move these inhibitors uh, forward into the program. Uh, finally, as a third uh, research foci, which is being led by uh, Preeti Kumar at Yale and, and Melanie Ott at Blasen Institute, together with other team members, but the whole goal of this aim is to disable the HIV provirus uh, by targeted genome um, engineering. Uh, this is really taking advantage of uh, some really exciting uh, work within the group, particularly from the group from from, from Germany uh, with, with Huber's group, where we've actually, uh, with this program, with the hypothesis that we can actually in vivo deliver genome uh, engineering therapeutics uh, permanently to inactivate HIV without any genotoxicity. So with uh, some of the bioengineers that we have in the program at Berkeley, uh, we've actually had some really exciting uh, work, particularly with two goals. The first goal really is to deliver uh, these double strand uh, uh, targets without having any uh, uh, double strand breaks, but also to have them scarless. 
and, and actually the work with Breck I, which is coming out of the Huber Group, uh, these are really exciting because they're actually smaller than CRISPR. Uh, they actually don't need a guide RNA, but also they're actually non-immunogenic, immunogenic as well. And actually, we actually have a clinical trial moving forward and hope to see the outcome of those studies. Uh, other processes uh, for genetic genome engineering, we'll talk about you know, base editing as well to try to delete certain bases, but also using uh, common uh, peptide nucleic acid uh, methods to try to silence uh, uh, and, and, and uh, permanently inactivate the genome. Uh, a second challenge, obviously, is delivery, and we've got uh, three different approaches that we're going to be looking at. The most exciting is really the viral uh, uh, like particle processes that we hope to tag to antibodies, and uh, PLGA nanoparticles has also been part of the, the program. Uh, some of the uh, targeted binding uh, peptide protein conjugates that we're looking at, uh, such as the CD7 VLPs that are being developed by uh, our group at Yale have really shown some really exciting work here. These VLPs have been tagged with CCR5, and in this humanized mouse model, as you can see, um, uh, with a single, actually, injection, uh, when you stop ART, uh, you can see with the controls, you actually get reduction in CD4 counts, uh, but with the uh, VLP tagged with CD7, which specifically targets the CD4 uh, T cells, you actually can see recovery of those CD4 T cells. So I think with these three research foci moving forward, we hope to have some really exciting strategies within the block, lock, and excise uh, uh, program. Uh, this isn't uh, complete without having our involvement of the community. I'm really excited that we have two members, uh, 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 Patricia Defeshiro and uh, uh, Dr. Sashashima here in Canada, working with the Community Arts Integrated Program uh, that we hope to move forward within the community to work together within our research teams. Uh, and this is also very strongly linked to our collaborators in Brazil, but also in, in Uganda as well. So we have built up many partnerships uh, within this program. Uh, for each of our different research foci, we have three individual pharmaceutical partners, Amgen, uh, Sangamo, but also um, uh, we have um, uh, one more company um, as part of the uh, research foci to support the activities constellation up on the top as well. Uh, and as you can see, we have interacted with many members here and we've been interacting with some of the other collaboratories as well. So we're relatively new and we've had a couple of publications and abstracts that have been accepted already. And you can learn more about our program on our website, uh, but also on our Twitter account. And really want to thank the funders, which are many of the institutes of the NIH for this program. So happy to take any questions. Okay, my 15 minutes. We'll get questions after. Sure, okay. okay. Right, our last speaker for the session is Marian Puddams, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the HIV Cure Research Center in the laboratory of Linus Wendertro. After her studies in biomedical sciences at the University of Libre de Bruxelles, Marian moved to Montreal to start her PhD program in the laboratory of Nicola Schumann. There, she developed a new assay to quantify and characterize the latent HIV reservoir. Her project aims at identifying potent latency reversing agents. She'll be presenting on HIV reactivation from latency using a TAC compound. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, would like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to present my data today. I actually did my PhD here in Montreal, so that's a real pleasure for me to be back here to present some of my data. And I will be talking about uh, the usage of a TAT compound to reactivate HIV from latency. And this is actually the first time that we can disclose the nature of this compound, so I'm actually quite excited to present those data today. So, this work was done in collaboration with Janssen Pharmaceutica, and before I'm going to the results section, I would like to do a brief overview about the shock and kill strategy. So the principle of this strategy is to use the latency reversing agents to force HIV to reactivate from latency. So this latent HIV will start producing transcripts, proteins, viral particles, and those latently infected cells will become visible again to the immune system and might eventually be cleared by uh, immune-mediated clearance. 
So there are different types of latency reversing agents that you can use to reactivate HIV from latency. You can, for example, use mitogens such as PMA, PHA, CD3, CD28. They are considered as the gold standard um, for in vitro assays because they are actually extremely potent at reactivating HIV, but they are highly toxic and therefore they cannot be used in the clinic. And they also induce global T cell activation, which is associated with changes in the transcriptome and in the phenotype of the cells. So there are other classes of LRA that have been tested in vitro and in vivo for the capacity to reactivate HIV. And this is the case, for example, of HTAC inhibitors, PKC agonists, et cetera. They are not as potent as mitogens to reactivate HIV, but most of them or part of them are safe to be used in vivo and they are under evaluation in clinical trials. And some classes do not induce global T cell activation. So there is a real interest in the field of HIV to identify compounds that are capable of reactivating HIV very efficiently without modifying the transcriptome and the phenotype of the cells. And in this context, Janssen has developed this TAT compound, which is actually mimicking the TAT protein, which is the transactivator of transcription, to specifically reactivate HIV from latency without modifying the transcriptome and the phenotype of the cells. So to, to test this TAT compound, we actually recruited a new cohort of participants who have been treated during the chronic phase of infection. So as you can see, indeed, um, most of the people from our cohort are um, male. Yeah, you can see the pointer now. Yeah, can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> they are male and indeed as well, most of them are subtype B uh, with some exceptions. Uh, they've been treated for a, or a period of time that ranges between 1.3 years and 25 years. And on the cells from those different participants, we've been doing like quite some different assays, the HIV flow assay, the STIPSIC assay, and the signal cell RNA sequencing assay. And I will guide you through um, those different assays during the presentation. So first, uh, we wanted to assess the reactivation capacity of uh, the TAT compounds, and this is the methodology that we used. So we stimulated the CD4 T cells from four R-treated individuals for uh, 24 hours or 48 hours. Yeah, this is not working so well. Yeah, okay, let's forget about it. Um, so yeah, they were stimulated for two different time points. Uh, I don't, yeah, they were stimulated for two different time points, 24 hours or 48 hours, uh, with the TAT compound alone or in combination with the HDAC inhibitor panobinostat. And we used PMA ionomycin as a positive control. So there were three different readouts that were done. Uh, there was uh, first we assessed the cell viability. Um, by flow cytometry using a live dead stain. We also collected the cells after stimulation to perform the HIV flow assay. So this is a flow cytometry based assay in which we use a combination of two different antibodies to target the P24 protein to determine the frequency of P24 positive cells following stimulation. And we also collected the plasma from those uh, same cultures to measure the concentration of P24 in the supernatant, uh, not the plasma, the supernatant. Um, and we performed the P24 uh, CMOA to assess the viral particle release in the supernatant. So if we first have a look at uh, the viability of the CD4 T cells following stimulation, if you compare to the non-stimulated control, yeah. If you compare to the non-stimulated control, you can see that the TAT compound alone is actually not affecting the cell viability of the cells, uh, both at 24 hours and 48 hours. If you now uh, combine the TAT compound with panobinostat, it is associated with a limited cell death at 24 hours post-stimulation. But if you look for the same condition at 48 hours post-stimulation, you see a big decrease in the cell viability, which is mainly due to the panobinostat treatment. So this is not due to the TAT treatment, but this is due to panobinostat, which is quite toxic at 48 hours in vitro. So we also assessed the frequency of P24 positive cells following latency reversal using this HIV flow assay. And those uh, results are represented as a fold induction relative to the positive control PMA ionomycin. So what you can observe is that the highest fold induction relative to PMA ionomycin is actually obtained at 24 hours post-stimulation with the combination of the TAT compound 
plus uh, panobinostat. So if you look at the example of uh, these participants, Mercury 01, you can see that when you stimulate the cells with PMA inomycin, you obtain a frequency of P24 positive cells that is around three P24 positive cells per million cells, which is actually quite low. When you now stimulate with the TAT compound plus panobinostat, you can reach a frequency of 11 P24 positive cells per million CD40 cells. So this is really increased compared to um, the PMA inomycin. What is also interesting and important to note is that the TAT compound alone is also capable of reactivating HIV, both at 24 hours and 48 hours, but it's particularly marked at 48 hours. But the fold induction is not as high as the one that we obtain uh, for the combination of the TAT compound plus the HDAC inhibitor panobinostat. So, okay, they are producing P24 intracellularly, but now is there a release of viral particles in the supernate? And this is in, also important to define. So again, uh, we, we performed the P24 SIMOA assay on uh, the supernatant from those cultures, and the results are expressed as a full induction relative to PNA inomycin. So again, you can see that if you stimulate with the TAT compound in combination with panobinostat, this is inducing the release of viral particles in the supernatant at 24 hours, but this is particularly marked at 48 hours. So we now have a combination that is actually quite potent to reactivate HIV from latency. So we wanted to know um, if this is the case on a big cohort of participants. So we applied this combination on the cells from the 22 participants from our cohorts, and we observed significantly higher frequencies of P24 positive cells following TAT plus panobinostat uh, stimulation compared to uh, PMA inomycin. And these actually represent a median fold increase of around four times. So we have a combination that is actually quite from because it's inducing uh, much higher, uh, higher levels of reactivations compared to uh, PMA idomycin. So we also wanted to know whether this uh, TAT compound is modifying the transcriptomic profile of the cells. So to answer that question, we did some microarray analysis on the bulk CD4 T cells from the same four participants, and we could identify three different clusters based on stimulation. So there was a cluster three that was formed of the cells that were stimulated with PMA inomycin, another cluster that was formed of the cells that were stimulated with panobinostat alone or in combination with uh, TAT. So this is really a cluster that is driven driven by panobinostat stimulation. And then finally, we also had a cluster that was formed of the non-stimulated controls, so non-stimulation and DMSO uh, treated cells, but also with the cells that were um, treated with the TAT compounds. So we can conclude that this TAT compound has a minimal impact on the transcriptomic profile of the cells since it clusters with the negative controls. So you can also study the phenotype of those P24 positive cells following stimulation. So I told you that we were using the HIV flow assay, which is a flow cytometry-based assay. And that means that you can include different markers uh, to have a look at the phenotype of those P24 positive cells following latency reversal. So what is really uh, interesting, if you look at PMA inomycin stimulation, you can see a clear downregulation of CD3 and CD4 expression at the protein level. If now you stimulate the cells with the TAT compound alone or in combination with panobinostat, you can see that the expression of CD3 and CD4 is completely preserved. And that means that you can actually study the CD4 expression in P24 positive cells, which cannot be done with PMA inomycin stimulation. So that's what we did. Uh, we looked at the CD4 MFI in the P24 positive cells compared to the P24 negative cells. And you can see that there is a clear down regulation of CD4 expression in the P24 positive cells. So this is represented on the uh, dot plot on the right, where the uh, gray plots are the P24 negative cells, and the, the uh, red dots are the P24 positive cells. And you can see that these P24 positive cells indeed are CD4 negative, and that's probably the consequence of uh, NF or NEF expression. So we also had a look at CD45 ARO and CD27 expression. Uh, which are markers for the different subsets of CD4, so namely the naive T cells, the central memory T cells, the effector memory T cells, and the terminally differentiated T cells. So when you stimulate with uh, the TAT compound alone or in combination with panobinostat, again, you can preserve the expression of these two uh, markers. Um, with PMA inomycin, you can also relatively preserve uh, the expression of those two markers, although it's not as good as the TAT compound alone or in combination with panobinostat.
So we first compared uh, the percentage of each of those subsets in the P24 negative cells uh, versus the P24 positive cells following latency reversal with TATL2 plus panobinostat. And what you can see is that most of the P24, almost none of the P24 positive cells had a naive or a terminally differentiated phenotype, which is actually what we expect. But um, there was a real enrichment of P24 positive cells in the effector memory fraction. And that was also shown in the past for the PME inomycin stimulation. So that was quite expected. So what you can also do is to compare the phenotype of those P24 positive cells between these two conditions of stimulation. So are there um, different phenotypes when you stimulate with stat plus panobinostat versus PMA inomycin? And so we, we did not detect any significant differences for any of those analyzed subsets. But what we noticed is that there was a, a trend towards more P24 positive cells with a central memory phenotype when you stimulate your cells with stat plus panobinostat compared to PMA inomycin. And this might eventually suggest that using this combination of LRA might favor the reactivations of cells with a central memory phenotype that are maybe harder to reactivate. So something else that you can do is to study the genetic and transcriptional uh, environment of those proviruses in P24 positive cells. So in practice, uh, you stimulate your CD4 T cells and then you stain them with the two antibodies against the P24. And then you will single cell sort these P24 positive cells in the 96 well plates. Once you have those P24 positive cells that are single cell sorted, you can do different things. Uh, for example, you can do single cell RNA sequencing to study the transcriptional landscape of those P24 positive cells. And uh, this will be the object of my talk on the 2nd of August at the AIDS conference in the Shake and Bake session. So I invite you to be there to know more about these interesting results. But today I will be mentioning the Stipsic essay, uh, which is a relatively new essay that we actually published in Nature Communication in 2021. So how does it work when once you have your P24 positive cells that are single cell sorted in each well, you will perform a multiple displacement amplif amplification step, which means that you will amplify the genome in every cell. So starting from one copy of DNA, you will end up with thousands of copies of DNA in each of those wells, which means that you can do several different assays on each cell. And so you can, for example, uh, perform near full length viral sequencing, but also uh, integration site analysis. And I will quickly show the results that we obtained for those two assays. So we first look at uh, near full length sequences in the P24 positive cells following latency reversal, either with PMA inomycin or with stat plus panobinostat. You can see that most of those P24 positive cells actually are more proviruses that have defects uh, in the PSI MSD region, and only 10% of them are actually intact uh, following stimulation. And if you compare the proportion of genome intact and PSI MSD defective proviruses between these two uh, conditions of stimulation, you can see that uh, the proportions are actually relatively similar between those two conditions of, stim of stimulation. We also had a look at the integration sites in these P24 positive cells following latency reversal in these two conditions of stimulation. And I will just show you the example of um, the Mercury 1 participant. Um, so every clone is uh, represented in a color, and those uh, individual sequences, uh, unique sequences, are represented in gray. So the, you can see that when you stimulate with stat plus panobinostat, the same clones or globally the same clones are reactivated compared to PMA inomycin. And there are some rare and minor, and minor clones that were only detected uh, in one of the two conditions. This is, for example, the case of the lock clone, which is represented in more violet that was only retrieved in the PMA inomycin condition. So basically they reactivate the same clones. Um, and these conclusion, conclusions can be applied uh, to the four different participants that we've been testing uh, in this analysis. So in conclusion, we are really excited that we found a TAT compound that reactivates HIV from latency, uh, does not impact cell viability in vitro, and does not modify the transcriptome and the phenotype of the cells. You can also combine it to different latency reversing agents, uh, such as the HAC inhibitor panobinostat, and it will induce latency reversal in a higher proportion of latently infected cells compared to PMA inomycin. And this is a median fold increase of around four. It also reactivates the same clones as PME inomycin, with uh, some exceptions. And I showed you that this can be used as a tool to study uh, the pro oh, 
yes, it can be used as a tool and to study the proviral sequence and integration site in P24 positive cells, but also to do a deep characterization of uh, the phenotype of the P24 positive cells. So this is a really exciting tool and I hope that we will be able to show you more results in the future. So I would like to um, thank all of the people from my lab who contributed a lot to this work, uh, the people from Janssen, all of the founding agencies, and the most uh, important, the participants who agreed to participate to this study. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marion. I invite you to sit. <laughs> and uh, I think Lish will join us as well. And Chris should still be here. And now we can take questions for all of you. And I think we will start with questions uh, from the chat, right? You want to yeah. start? Sure. All right. So the first question we got is, I first heard of shock and kill, block and lock strategies during the IS meeting in Vancouver in 2015 and today's 2022. What is taking us many years to get breakthroughs from these strategies? Oh. Sure, sure. Okay. So the question is, I first heard of shock and kill block and lock strategies in 2015, and today is 2022. What is taking us so many years to get breakthroughs from these strategies? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that works. Yeah. So I do agree, like I was also a bit skeptical about the shock and kill strategies and when I finished my PhD and then I came across this stat compound that seems to reactivate HIV very efficiently and my hope is um, coming up a bit again. <laughs> Um, to be eventually be capable of using um, those that compounds in vivo to reactivate HIV from latency. And I think that was the problem so far is that we didn't have molecules that were potent enough to induce HIV reactivation and to induce the expression of antigens and the release of, of viral particles in the supernatant. But um, yeah, I do hope that uh, there will be a change. And if we combine different techniques together and approaches together, I do have a hope that eventually it might work. Sorry. Um, great talks. Thank you. Um, my question is for Marion. A couple of questions, very nicely presented. You said TAT compound. You didn't tell us much about the compound. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, Jensen is biting my uh, hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's. We really look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and you didn't tell us much about effects on proliferation or decline of the reservoir. So, did you measure whether those cells actually die that you reactivate, and whether you get much proliferation? That's a very good question, actually. Um, yeah, so far we didn't check this, but it would be really interesting to do some uh, killing strategies approach to see whether indeed those cells can be killed. Um, once they start producing these viral particles. So far, we didn't do that, but we had a look at the transcriptional data and it looks that um, they were, yeah, those P24 positive cells seem to express more genes that were related to apoptosis compared to the P24 negative cells. So they seem to maybe die more than the P24 negative cells in response to that compound. Great, thank you. You want to take one online or... Okay, yes. Yeah. So one online is BNAP specifically help defend target cells before infection. How can they be used in cure research where a person already has virus in his DNA? Chris, I think this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think this you gets back to, to the, the earlier talk that if if there is any ongoing expression of a viral antigen, then then those antibodies would be uh, no, I able missed to target those Sorry, I missed the. I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm tired. I guess <laughs> is it the the one. Yeah, the okay, BNABs specifically help to. I don't have my glasses on <laughs> <laughs> to defend target cells before infection. How can they be used in cure research? Yes, that was for the previous talk, actually, for the BNABs. And I don't think we have Christian anymore here. So anyway, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, for Alish, hmm. you want to read this one? All right. Will you be accounting for the potential blocking effect of estrogen and sex differences in your studies? Uh, yeah, no, that's a great, important question, and we've ensured that all our studies, as best as we can, are gender compliant, but also um, with our clinical cohorts, um, we also have uh, some of the silencing promoting agents in vivo, We're really looking at people, transgender populations, because of some of the silencing promoting agents we hope to um, investigate, so we, we are taking that in 
seriously and involved in both our animal studies, but also our human studies too. Yeah, Javier Martinez Picado, Barcelona. Uh, my question is to Marion. Uh, great, great presentation. So, uh, uh, congratulations. Two brief questions. Uh, one is that apparently the fact that you see mainly are in combination with panovinostat. So, when you look at panovinostat, apparently the reactivation is not that great. So, when you see that in combination, they are. So, can you give us a mechanistic explanation for that? That's uh, the first question. The second one is Did you look at the transcriptomic analysis? Uh, after using the both compounds together, because the data that you show is only by using the TAT compound. But since the effect is probably synergistic, I think it would be more accurate to look at the transcriptomic profile of both of them together. For the phenotype, you mean? For the, uh, for the transcriptomic analysis. So when we did the transcriptomic analysis, we tried both the TAT plus panobinostats, and actually it modified too much to the transcriptomic profile of the cells, and we couldn't see any difference between the P24 positive cells and the P24 negative cells. So we had to redo the entire analysis, um, and we just stimulated with the TAT compound alone this time. So there were no uh, modifications in the transcriptomic profile of the cells. And this time we could identify six differentially expressed genes um, between the P24 positive cells and P24 negative cells. So indeed, um, for the transcriptomic analysis, we um, focused our data on the TAT stimulated cells, uh, but for the rest, uh, mostly on the TAT plus panobinostats. And I don't remember. Uh, any mechanistic yeah, explanation for the uh, synergistic effect between the two compounds? Yeah, I just think um, so. The TAT compound is mostly at, acting on the elongation phase of transcription. And I think by using panobinostat, you can open the chromatin. So you act on the initiation of transcription. And I think by putting both together, you have like a combo that is acting both on the initiation and elongation steps of transcription. I think that's probably the me mechanistic part of it. Thank you. Right. Okay, so we'll do one from online. Do CD20 CAR T cells kill or reduce THF cells? We wouldn't expect them to kill them directly. Um, we would expect that by revealing them to, to CD8s, um, that the CD8 T cells would come in and kill them. We, we need to go back and, and see how effective that was. That might be one reason why we didn't see the reservoir reduction is for any number of reasons that might have been limited, but it, it shouldn't be direct. It should be indirect by mixing those two compartments that were previously separated. Oh, oh thank you for Marian, a great talk. Uh, so you didn't mention anything about what concentrations are using this compound. That's my first question. And I don't know if you can speak a little bit of, are you using concentrations in the nanomolar or in the micromolar or in the millimolar. Second, do you require TAT, endogenous TAT? So you are call, calling a TAT compound. So what I think about it is like, you are mimicking the structure of TAT to bind to the TAR element to actually drive the transcription or are you re, you know, displacing bromodomains or things like that? So do, do you know a little bit of how it works? That's a really good question. So for the concentration of TAT, it's 1.4 nanomolar. So I think it's uh, it's a uh, quite low uh, concentration. So it looks to work really nicely. And then for the second part of the question, I just forgot what it was. Uh, so I mean, you call it a TAT compound. I, so is it mimicking I, yeah, yeah. like the binding of TAT into the TAR element, and then it drives? Or do you require endogenous TAT from the virus to be present? To the, for the compound to have activity. So, so I think it's just like in these latent conditions, the endogenous that is just not expressed at um, sufficient levels to favor the reactivation from latency. And so when you bring these stats from, um, from, yeah, from outside, basically you will have like the minimal quantity of that that you need to favor this positive feedback loop and the virus itself will start producing its own stats. And that's why um, there will be such a reactivation from HIV, and I believe this is really this positive feedback loop that is making it work, actually. Because I don't think you will bring a lot of, of that from the outside, but it's minimal enough or sufficient enough to stir this feedback loop. Right, we'll do one from online. Um, we just heard two talks, one about TAT inhibitors to silence cell activity, and one about using a TAT analog to stimulate it. Are these approaches contradictory or complementary? <laughs> um, that's uh, my favorite question so <laughs> start with the second one it is different and we're obviously focusing on an inhibitory process to, to block the virus and essentially 
lock it. So um, it is a completely opposite effect to shock and kill. We, we are trying a different strategy uh, to try to silence the virus. Yeah, I do. I do agree. I don't think they are complementary in that. Yeah, in that sense that they are doing two different things or two opposite things. Um, yeah, let's see. Let's see who wins. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so before we go into a fight, I will take the next question. Louise, please. Hi, my question is for Marion. Great talk. Um, I'm going to go away of this mystery <laughs> compound. I mean, staying in it, but asking another question. So you talk about this compound and you saw that the cells that were P24 um, positive were mostly C4 negative as well. And we know that this is mostly lead by NAF. And when you induce also CD4 uh, down regulation, it's mostly linked to also MHC1 down regulation. And so if you think about it, there is the reactivation part, but there is also the killing part. And thinking about the killing part, then how do you think that's going to put in place? Because if you don't have MHC1 expression, then how are your CD8 specific are going to work? And of course, you have NK cells, but are they going to be seen? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And so far, I'm not sure I have a, an answer for that. And I think uh, this is joining a bit the question from Sharon, um, whether those cells will be killed. And um, I think we will be testing that in the future, but that's the next thing. Have you stained for MHC1? Did you no, I did any? not, okay. but um, I'll suggest you maybe will... add it to your panel. This is actually very easy to do, and so I'm putting that in the panels soon. Oh, I can ask you <laughs> can this one. Okay, so we have very technical questions for you, Marion. Um, for Dr. Pardon, sorry. Could you verify if the P24 positive CD4 negative, so the cells that have done regulated CD4, were expressing NFL non defective sequencing? Alternatively, did you check for expression of NKG2 DBST2 uh, on these stem cells? Yeah, that's definitely something that could be done uh, very um, easily. And I think so far we tested a very limited panel that just included CD45 arrow, CD27. There was also PD1, uh, CD3, CD4, but um, that was a very limited panel. And I think there is room in the future to uh, make a panel maybe of 30 antibodies to deeply characterize those cells and have a look for those different markers. Um, but so far we haven't done it, but um, this is on the way. Yeah, oh, okay. Hi, I'm Dennis again. <laughs> um, my, my question is for um, everybody, I guess. So um, when we, I work at Brad's lab and whenever we test a latency reversing agent, we drop it on PBMCs and we see that it like, just totally like knocks out the CD8 responses or diminishes the NK responses or any of these effector functions. So have you tested your agents or latency reversing um, agents in the context of effectors like CD8s or NKs and does it have any negative effects on those cell types? Thanks. Yeah, again, I haven't done it, but um, I think all of those questions are going in the same direction. And uh, I think there is a lot of interest. So I'm definitely taking note for that. And uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I will let you know when I have an answer. Definitely. Uh, my question is for Chris, but it's also for everybody because I wanted to ask about this. Chris, this is Michael. Hi, good to see you Hi. back there in Seattle. But not, you know, you know, roasting away. Um, my question is something you said about the correlates between the four cures, and you mentioned that graft versus host disease was one of those, and yet there are cases in those examples that did not have any graft versus host disease. Can you explain why you still think it was a correlate? Um, and what do you think is also going on there where some people seem to have benefited from it, where other people don't seem to need it? It's a very good question. I, I, I think that the most that we've been able to bear out from the non-human primate studies is, is there's just an overwhelming amount of toxicity from, from the graft versus host effect. And trying to tease that out for what effect it's having on the reservoir has, has been hard to unravel. I, I'm sort of citing back to the cancer literature that it, it see the, the data that's out there for graft versus leukemia is that people who have more of a graft versus host effect tend to have a better suppression of, of or, or less rebound of cancer over time. So that's sort of the hypothesized aspect of what's going on. But you're right, those are very good questions. And, and they've just been very difficult to answer because the, the process is so toxic. So I think there could be molecular mechanisms going on that we just don't understand. And if we could unravel those and reapply them, it would be great. But 
at the present time, trying to de uncouple the toxicity from the efficacy has been really difficult. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the three um, talks. They were great. My question is for Chris. So I was wondering, what is your hypothesis for the slow reconstitution of the B cells in your sheep um, cohort? And I wondered if there was a correlation with the viral loads before treatment was initiated in, 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 this, um, in, in that cohort. And then my other question is whether there was a, dif a difference in the distribution, in the memory distribution of the CD4 T cells after the CAR T cell therapy. We haven't looked at the, the distribution of, of memory subsets in, in that great of a depth, we, we, we have that data and there's nothing that jumped out at first pass, but it's something that I think we need to really look at more deeply. Um, we haven't done that yet. Um, as far, sorry, can you remind me the, the second question? Uh, so the, the, the other question was about um, what's your hypothesis on why there's slow reconstitution and um, if, and if you measured the viral loads before you initiated treatments and treatment and if that correlated with the reconstitution? Yeah, we, we did not see any correlation between viral loads prior to art initiation and the impact on viral rebound. We actually had one animal um, that was SHIV infected and art suppressed that had to end study early because of an opportunistic infection following the B cell depletion. And that was one of the animals that was in the controller subset. So it didn't seem like higher viremia was leading to any kind of complications, but that does highlight the point that there is, uh, the, the study does suggest that there's going to be an increased susceptibility to opportunistic infections while those B cells are gone. Um, as far as the mechanisms underlying the, the slowed down B cell recovery, I, I would broadly you know, harking back to the ongoing immune dysfunction and, and maybe lack of, of B cell, proper B cell and T cell crosstalk that would let those B cells come back. But that's really hand wavy at this point. I, I think there could be a lot of mechanisms going on there. And I think most importantly is, is going to be to get more into the clinical literature again, because so many, there's going to be more and more cases of people living with HIV undergoing these um, CAR T cell therapies, and it would be really useful to know um, if that's something that's seen in cancer patients as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Chris, Jonathan Angel from Ottawa. Maybe you've already done or published this work, but but I'd wonder, wouldn't rituximab be a much easier way of knocking out C20 positive B cells rather than using a, a CD20 specific CAR T cell approach, and um, and uh, maybe you just comment on that whether that's been done or that's known because that's so it would seem to be a much easier approach to what you've proposed. Yeah, for sure, and that was actually the first approach that was taken by Offa McCoy and Lewis Picker at at Oregon Health Sciences. It's what what they've seen is that the rituximab approach is not as efficient at breaking down these follicles as the CAR T cells are. So we're also doing some of these experiments um, with them and. They presented some of this um, data back at the 2019 HIV persistence meeting way back when. Um, but the, the, the short answer is that rituximab or an antibody-based therapy just isn't doing as good of a job at, at breaking down these follicles. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sina. I come from Botswana. My question is directed to the three presenters. And I'm... I'm talking from the community point of view. We are excited about uh, the two people that were, that were cured from HIV, uh, the London and the Berlin patient. But we also know that uh, it's not easy to be achieved. The results were taxing. Um, from the community point of view, we want medication uh, that is accessible, affordable, Will you, actually, especially, I've already taken the, the baking thing when I was doing my planning. I'm going to attend your presentation. Will you assure us that uh, uh, if, if uh, you win or whoever comes forth, will it be accessible, affordable for our people? Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh... 
comment, and I think uh, that is really the, the ultimate goal, is to make it affordable, accessible to, to everybody who um, is afflict afflicted with HIV from, from, from different age groups, um, uh, different demographics, and different, different regions. So I think we're all speaking the same, same language. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I have that much to add, but obviously this is the goal and I really hope that we can reach this and uh, yeah, maybe shock and kill strategies and silencing strategies are just relying on molecules uh, that might eventually be affordable, I think. So, yeah. Mm. I don't know. I, and I would just add that, there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what I would add is that the study we did, I, I don't think this is something that we would propose as a therapy. This is similar to, you know, the the patients that you or participants that you highlighted, HIV malignancy participants in these studies are, are very important and allow us to learn a lot about the mechanisms that are going on with virus persistence. So in this study, we were using the, the B cell depletion as more as a, sort of a basic science tool to understand what we need to do to get rid of these reservoir cells. And I think, again, we're seeing that, that it's going to be quite a challenge. Um, but I, I totally agree that the, what I presented here is not something that, that we would Propose to you know apply in a, in a broader um, population of people living with HIV. Great, I think that marks the end of the session. We will now break for a coffee break and return in twenty minutes. Um, before we leave, I'd like to thank all the speakers again for the wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you, everyone.